the detailed mechanistic background of all these diseases in normal uh, physiology and in, in pathophysiology is extremely important uh, to know to be able to develop these new concepts and these uh, new treatments. And the same goes for the area where, where I uh, am interested. Uh, I work in Kevin Tracy's lab here on how nerves control inflammation. And, and this concept has, in a way, been around for about 2,000 years. It um, was suggested by Celsus when he described the four hallmarks of, hallmarks of inflammation, um, which had that, after that has been taught to, I think, virtually all medical students which is um, uh, dolor, calor, rubor, tumor. In, in English it would be uh, heat, swelling, redness and pain. And with the knowledge that we have of modern medicine, it's easy for us to associate pain with higher cortical functions and brain functions and uh, absolutely the nervous system and connecting it to inflammation, which he did 2000 years ago. But he didn't have the framework to, uh, of knowledge to put it in the right context. And um, as, as recently as a hundred years ago, uh, this context wasn't there either. So the developments in immunology and uh, neurophysiology and uh, neuroscience over the last hundred years has really enabled what I, as Kevin, hope will be a revolution in how we can treat these diseases. Uh, Charles Sherrington received the Nobel Prize in, in uh, medicine for discovering the reflexes neural reflexes uh, about 100 years ago. And he described three components, major components, a sensory eliciting organ and uh, a connecting neural arc and a target organ like a muscle or a gland. There are important reflexes for our daily lives that are monosynaptic reflexes that work like this. Most re reflexes are much more complex and have not tons of interneurons and are also regulated by signals from higher uh, centra. But these reflexes are really important for us uh, in, in our daily life. Uh, another crucial, more complex reflex is the well-known bar reflex, where sensors in the aortic arc and, or arch and, and uh, carotid body send signals through the afferent vagus nerve to uh, brainstem centra and then efferent signals in cholinergic and adrenergic nerves uh, uh, regulate heart rate and vascular contractility. And this helps us from fainting or prevents us from fainting every time we stand up. So this is really important. Um, another important function for survival is our defense against invading microbes. Um, and we have a very competent immune system that every time there is uh, an attack or invasion, it immediately detects it uh, and elicits a response, which includes release of cytokines, recruitment of other uh, uh, lymphocytes, and also some central neural responses, including fatigue, pain, anorexia. This is a very powerful response that in itself can be harmful. Cytokines in themselves can sh cause shock and, and tissue damage and even death. And there are regulatory mechanisms in place that keep this in check. Uh, regulatory T cells, other immune cells, soluble receptors, glucocorticoids, etc. And there is an increasing body of evidence that also neural circuits are very important in regulating this uh, very crucial response. The neuro nervous system is actually extremely well suited for this task anatomically and functionally. The body, throughout the body, there is a very tight mesh of neurons through all surfaces and almost every nook and cranny of the body. And these uh, neurons are, of course, uh, capable of extremely quickly transmitting information over long uh, signals, over long distances, and informing other parts of the body what's hap about what's happening. Uh, they are also equipped with a number of receptors for, uh, for cytokines, for damage-associated molecular patterns and pathogen-associated uh, molecular patterns. They can detect changes in pH and are generally very capable. Um, so this system is in place in such a dense mesh that for immune cells to move, they literally have to navigate in between neurons. So they are in the periphery in close contact. Um, 
Furthermore, a fascinating study by Clifford Wolf and his colleagues presented half a year ago in Nature showed that in, uh, at the time of invasion of Staphylococcus aureus bacteria, when, when Staphylococcus aureus invade, the nerves detect this invasion independent of the immune response. There are receptors formal pep for formal peptides on the, on the neurons that respond, and other mechanisms are also in play that elicit signals in sensory neurons that inform the body of uh, what's happening. Also, there is an axonal, re axonal reflex response that may re directly regulate the immune response locally. This sensory response can elicit, elicit a reflex, and so this was discovered about 20 years ago by Dr. Nijima. And the experiment he performed was that he instilled a cytokine IL-1 into the portal vein of rats. And when he did that, he found uh, that he could measure outgoing nerve signals in the spleen, in the splenic nerve, showing that there is, a, there is a motor response to this sensory provocation by the cytokine. Now, this response was absent. You can, if you see the lower curve, there, it was absent when he severed the, the vagus nerve, that, uh, the branch to the, to the hepatic branch. So the hepatic branch of the vagus nerve is uh, is necessary for uh, eliciting this response. So there is a reflex response in, in place here. So realizing the potential crucial role of the vagus nerve, Kevin Tracy and Ludmila Borovikova performed an experiment where they stimulated the outgoing vagus nerve and looked at cytokine production. We know that the vagus nerve is important for tons of bodily functions and regulates all kinds of organs, but it wasn't clear what it did to cytokine production and the immune system. And when they did that, um, here they, uh, they treated mice with endotoxin, inducing endotoxemia, and then they looked at cytokine production in, in serum. And they found that uh, sham-treated animals had a certain level, the white bar. Um, if they had damaged or cut the vagus nerve, the cytokine, the TNF release was higher, but if they had stimulated the vagus nerve prior to the uh, to endotoxin delivery, the cytokine response was reduced. Not only did this reduce the cytokine response, but also rescued them from hypotension. So the top, uh, top line here shows the vagus nerve treated animals, which had a much reduced reduction in blood pressure. Subsequently, this efferent arc has been um, has been delineated by colleagues that are present today. Jared Houston has an important contribution, and, and Marisa Rosa Spalina. And it has, it's now clear that if the vagus nerve is stimulated proximally, uh, if, if it is uh, severed um, anywhere along its pathway to the spleen, uh, the effect of cytokine regulation will, uh, will be abolished. In endotoxemia, importantly, the spleen is a major producer of, of systemic TNF. Um, now, during the course of these studies, it was also discovered that the cholinergic receptor, the alpha-7 nicotinic acid choline receptor, is crucially important for the uh, delivery of this signal because alpha-7 nicotinic acid choline receptor deficient mice uh, do not benefit in this way from vagus nerve stimulation. So based on this knowledge, we can conclude that in addition to all the well-known, well-described functions of the vagus nerve, we need to add uh, an immune regulatory role of the wanderer, this long nerve in the body. And in detail, um, the insights these insights form are the basis of our understanding of this inflammatory reflex, which starts with vagus nerve, sensory vagus uh, branches, sensing cytokines in the periphery, uh, signaling to the brainstem nuclei, which elicit <coughs> outgoing efferent cholinergic signals in the vagus nerve, which progress to the adrenergic splenic nerve and ultimately inhibit cytokine production by macrophages in the spleen. 
Activation of this pathway has been tried in a number of, ex uh, in a, in a number of experimental diseases with, with very encouraging results. Here is, is a list of a few. And especially the model of rheumatoid arthritis, the collagen-induced arthritis and colitis, are interesting because they preceded two clinical trials um, with implanted vagus nerve stimulators. Although this nicely shows components of this reflex, there are pieces missing. And one aspect that was discussed or unclear was that if, if the efferent signals in the vagus nerve are enough to, um, to elicit the, this signal, to, to in, inhibit cytokines in endotoxemia. And to address this question, Jakob Levine and, and I uh, did a simple experiment where we stimulated here. Do we have? Which, uh, uh, we stimulated the, the vagus nerve. Uh, and when stimulating just on the, on the nerve, the signal will go both up and down. The, this gave the response reduction on, of um, TNF in, uh, in serum. But then we anesthetized both ner vagus nerves and st stimulated them bilaterally. And this gave the same response, showing that the efferent vagus nerve stimulation is sufficient to elicit this t cytokine inhibitory response. Uh, the next question was the alpha-7 expression. The alpha-7 deficient animals, they don't respond to the vagus nerve stimulation. But alpha-7 is expressed in, in the immune system, in, in, in ganglia, and in the central nervous system. And it wasn't really clear where the alpha-7 expression was required. So to address this, we created chimeric mice uh, by bone marrow transfer. And essentially, this one chimeric mice had an alpha-7 deficient nervous system, but an alpha-7 competent immune system. And when we performed vagus nerve stimulation, TNF was reduced compared to sham as expected. When we did the reciprocal experiment in an animal with essentially an alpha-7 deficient immune system, the vagus nerve stimulation didn't reduce the cytokine response. So we concluded here that the system the efferent is sufficient to the efferent signal is sufficient to reduce cytokine release from macrophages, and the alpha seven requirement is on macrophages in spleen, not elsewhere in the circuit. But there were more things that were unclear. Uh, the vagus nerve is cholinergic, uh, and the alpha seven is uh, a cholinergic receptor, but the splenic nerve is uh, an adrenergic nerve. So, how? What is the signal, the cholinergic signal, transferred from the cholinergic nerve to the alpha-7 receptor? Um, to address this, we, um, we, we thought about the, where the, the source of the ligand could be. And since the, nerve, since the spleen is devoid of cholinergic nerve, there had to be another source. And we made use of reporter mice because the enzyme required for acetylcholine production is called in acetyltransferase. So uh, we, we looked in sections of spleen in reporter mice and found that lymphocytes in the spleen, <coughs> cholinastyl transferase reporter mice, are in close opposition to nerve endings here shown as red synaptophysin positive nerves. And so if these T cells that produce acetylcholine are required for the transmission of the signal, it, vagus nerve stimulation shouldn't inhibit uh, cytokines uh, release in, in uh, T-cell deficient mice. So we tried in T-cell deficient mice and it, it, it didn't work. So, but when these, these T-cell deficient mice could be rescued by transfer of, of uh, normal lymphocytes, transfer T-cells. But if we knocked out the enzyme called acid transferase in these T-cells or in these lymphocytes before we transfer them, there was no effect of vagus nerve stimulation on cytokine production, showing that this enzyme and acetylcholine production is required for the transmission and the integrity in the inflammatory reflex. Now, so this was an interesting cell, a choline acetyltransferase positive T cell that relays neural signals. So we wanted to know more about these cells and took advantage of the Indian consortium that has transcriptional data on 
all known or at least very many known uh, immune cells. And we compared it to 199 other immune cells, the transcriptional data, and found that only one subpopulation has uh, expresses a high level of cold mass gill transferase, which is the T cells that we isolate, isolated. And in the context of uh, whole transcription analysis by hierarchical clustering in among other splenic immune cells, these T cells form a, uh, a separate cluster. So they are transcriptionally quite different and unique uh, from other T cells. Interestingly, the, uh, the primary adrenergic receptors of these cells are the beta-2 adrenergic receptors, and we found that it, these responded, cells responded to norepinephrine adrenergic stimuli with release of acetylcholine in a dose-dependent manner here shown in the graph. So now we can add this T cell to the inflammatory reflex cartoon, and this norepinephrine responding T cell uh, relay signals from the splenic nerve to the acetylcholine receptors on macrophages in spleen. So we found it very interesting with an acetylcholine producing lymphocytes, especially considering that there are a number of tissues in the body that have expressed acetylcholine receptors but are devoid of cholinergic innervation. And that's especially interesting because acetylcholine is a very lab lab labile compound. It's degraded very quickly by esterases that are ubiquitously available. So we, we asked the question, could it be that these acetylcholine-producing T cells transmit cholinergic signals to, uh, to organs that have cholinergic receptors but are devoid of, of uh, cholin uh, cholinergic innervation? And an interesting compartment is the vasculature, because all vessels are innervated by adrenergic nerves. And it's been known since the 70s that endothelial cells respond very strongly to acetylcholine by release of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide relaxes the vasculature, so that reduces blood pressure. In, in, on a day like this, where we think about therapy and new, new ways of helping people, it's uh, interesting to consider that hypertension is one of the leading uh, causes of um, cardiovascular disease or um, really risk factors for cardiovascular disease, which is the most common cause of death in the world. Anyway, so, so to investigate if, if these, if T cells that release acetylcholine uh, interact with endothelial cells and, and possibly make them make more uh, nitric oxide so that they reduce blood pressure, we created Billy created, and, and calling us the transferase overexpressing T cells, which we injected into the circulation of mice. And what we, together with uh, Dr. Miller's lab, and what we find is that normal jerked T cells, they didn't change blood pressure, while the chat overexpressing T cells reduced blood pressure, and so did acid, a huge dose of acetylcholine, dose of acetylcholine. So what's the mechanism for this? Well, if it's NO, there, is, there are readily available inhibitors. One is LNMMA. So we, if we pre-treated the mice with an ENOS NO production inhibitor, LNMMA, we abolished the effect of acetylcholine release from these T cells on the blood pressure. This was further corroborated when we co-cultured the primary colonastyl transferase positive lymphocytes with endothelial cells and looked at the activation step of endothelial nitric oxide synthase, the phosphorylation of endothelial cells, uh, nitric oxide synthase, which increased uh, after an, uh, exposure to acetylcholine or the chat positive t, t cells. So, but studying this further required new technology because there are tons of adrenergic receptors all throughout the body and they have many interesting effects, especially on, on blood pressure, but also on immune responses. And since we realized that this, this T cell shared some features of a neuron with this relay of neural signals, we 
turn to a, a technology that has been used successfully in, in neuroscience, which is optogenetics. Um, uh, this technology enables cell-specific control of neur uh, neuronal function using light. Neurons are transduced with light-sensitive proteins that then can be activated by, by light and uh, neuronal signals elicited. Um, so we turn to building again and then ask, can we, can we do this with T-cells? <laughs> and um, uh, he was able to assemble components for a beta adrenergic re receptor with, uh, with a light sensitive part and, and transduce T cells to become uh, light sensitive with a beta adrenergic, or the beta 2 adrenergic pathway to be light sensitive in T cells. And when we stimulated these T cells using light, um, we found that they release more acetylcholine to the medium. Uh, so would this have any effect in, in the immune, immune context or in, in uh, so to ev evaluate this, we co-cultured, or rather we cultured raw cells, macrophage, mouse, macrophage like cells, and then exposed them to medium from these, derived from these light exposed cells, looked at TNF production, and found that light induced acetylcholine production reduces uh, TNF in these cultures. Um, so, so now we have a tool to, with light, control the, the acetylcholine release of these T cells. So in summary, Kevin and colleagues have, have discovered the inflammatory reflex. We now know detailed components uh, of the reflex and this enables us to use devices already in clinical use to stimulate the afferent vagus nerve. One can envision stimulating other points, central nuclei or, or the splenic nerve. Also, which I think is very appealing, is to not only bluntly stimulate, but also have sensory circuits that can modulate and adapt the response depending on the current physiological situation. And also our mm, uh, knowledge on the novel components of this pathway um, identifies other points of uh, other targets, the, the receptors and macrophages, the T cells themselves and the receptors. Um, so I think there are plenty of opportunities it's only to, to address this particular uh, neural circuitry, which is only one of the many that may regulate inflammation. So many people have been involved in this work. Um, for example, Michaela Oswald from the Gregerson lab did the bioinformatics. <laughs> ben Steinberg and Bill Haynes in our lab. Jacob Levine is an expert on vagus nerve stimulation. Aquita Hudson, Mauricio Rosa Spolina, and of course, Kevin Tracy. Thank you. <laughs>